In the last video, we introduced the idea of an inverse trig function, but because there's uh, so much to talk about or that we could talk about with inverse trig functions, uh, what we did was we really just focused only on the inverse sine or the arc sine function and, and talked extensively about him, but that didn't leave us any time to talk about the arc cosine function or the arc tangent function. So in this video, it's, it's going to be a lot shorter. Uh, we're not going to go through all those details again, but uh, I just want to relay uh, some of the important information that we do need to know about arc cosine and, and arc tangent. So we'll just kind of treat all three of these as a packet and just kind of look at all three of them, even though I might reiterate a few words about the arc sine function that, that we already know. Okay, so uh, starting off, when you're talking about inverse trig functions, you'll notice that none of these guys immediately have an inverse function. Now, why? Well, they don't pass the vertical and horizontal line test. They do pass the vertical line test, so, the, so that makes them functions, but they don't pass the horizontal line test, which means that they are not invertible functions. So what's the fix? What, what do we do to, to fix that? Well, for all three of these guys, we are going to restrict the domain uh, and only look at a smaller portion of the graph that is one-to-one -one or monotonic, which means that it passes the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. So we're already familiar with this idea for the sine function. We're going to restrict it from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. We're only going to look from here to here. And if you look at just the green line here, you'll notice that it passes the vertical line test as well as the horizontal line test, which means this just this part is invertible. And so we'll, we'll um, unpack what this guy's inverse function looks like in just a second. Now, if you tried the same idea with cosine, you would actually get in trouble, unfortunately. If you look from minus pi over two to pi over two, like you did for the sine curve, What's wrong with this? Why, why is that not the correct restriction for the cosine graph? Well, if you look here, it still doesn't pass the vertical and horizontal line test. In fact, it fails the horizontal line test. So we want to use a similar idea, but obviously minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 is not the right interval. So what's kind of been decided on over the years is uh, to not go from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, but to go from 0 to pi. So notice we shifted that restricted domain just slightly, and so this is 1 to 1. So this part is invertible, this green guy right here. All right, uh, again, looking at tangent, same issue. Where are we going to restrict this? Well, it seems a pretty natural idea to restrict it between two of these vertical asymptotes that we have, and that's precisely what we do. So we're going to restrict this guy from minus pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, and we're just going to look at, at this restricted domain right here, this restricted portion of the, the tangent curve. So, um, so these are three restricted domains that we're going to actually invert. Uh, notice the great thing about all three of these guys is all three of them still achieve the same range. They still go from, for sine, still goes from minus 1 to 1. You still get all of your y values that you used to get. Uh, tangent, you still go from minus 1 to 1, so you still get all of his y values. And tangent still goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. So it's kind of a a win-win situation there. So anyways, um, that is the uh, restricted domain. So now let's go through one at a time and, uh, and just briefly look at each of these uh, inverse trig functions independently. So here's inverse sine, um, also called arc sine. Now you remember, why do, why do we call it arc sine? Well, uh, for some people, this is awfully confusing having a minus one. It looks almost like an exponent. So to eliminate that confusion, some people use the word arc sine instead of sine inverse, but they are 100% the, uh, the exact same thing. Okay, so what's the domain and range of the inverse sine function? Well, it's exactly the opposite of the domain and range for the sine function. Uh, for the sine function, the range, if you recall, went minus 1 to 1. Well, now our domain will go minus 1 to 1. You see here, you, you go from minus 1 to 1. And the outputs of the arc sine function would go from minus pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 
just like the restricted domain of the original sine function was minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. So, um, so that's the pertinent information that we need to, to know about the, um, the inverse sine function. Okay, um, here's inverse cosine. Uh, the restricted uh, domain, if you recall, on the original cosine function was 0 to pi. Well, that means that our range will go 0 to pi. And for the old cosine function, the original range was minus 1 to 1, which means our domain will be minus 1 to 1. All right? And the graph looks something like this. And uh, lastly, the, the inverse tangent function. If you remember, the range used to be all real numbers. Well, now the domain is all real numbers. So you can say from negative infinity to positive infinity, uh, or you could just shorthand this as all real numbers. That's a capital R with an extra bar out front. And that means all real numbers from minus infinity to, to infinity. All right, now the range you have to be a little careful about. Um, if you remember the restricted domain for the tangent graph was minus pi over two to pi over two. And so it'll be something like that for our range but you remember on the original tangent graph, minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 were vertical asymptotes that we never touched. Well, here they're going to switch to become horizontal asymptotes that we never touch. So it's very important to put parentheses here because you don't actually ever touch pi over 2. It kind of hugs it, but uh, doesn't ever actually touch it. So that's your domain and your range for uh, three of your major uh, inverse trig functions. Now, you know, we could make this video even longer and talk about arc secant and cosecant and cotangent. I don't think I'm going to do that here. Uh, one, they're, they're nowhere near as commonly used. But, um, but you know, second of all, on, on top of that, there's um, also even some disagreement as to what the restricted domains and ranges should be for those guys. Um, uh, you know, to be honest with you, there's nothing really uh, inherently right or wrong about choosing an interval like, you know, minus pi over two to pi over two. Uh, it's just, you know, basically what, what's decided upon. I mean, I, I suppose we could have, in fact, you know, chose this to be you know, your restricted uh, domain and, you know, it would have changed the, the graph of the arc sine function. But, you know, here we chose what's natural, you know, what seems natural to us uh, for the arc secant and cosecant and cotangent, you know, it's not, it's not quite as clear. So uh, anyways, for those reasons, we're not going to talk about the inverse secant and cosecant and cotangent functions, but, um, but the three main guys that you'll use primarily uh, we covered here in this video. So there's still a little bit left that needs to be said about inverse trig functions, like how you take their derivatives, how you evaluate them at certain places and things like that. And uh, so now if you want to go on to uh, fast forward to watch uh, some of those videos, we'll cover those topics shortly.